Hey everybody, and thanks for joining me. I'm Samuel Singer, the founder and executive director of Wyoming Stargazing, an education outreach nonprofit organization based here in Jackson, Wyoming. We've been sharing the extraordinary skies of Jackson with visitors and residents for the past seven years. Uh, today, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the upcoming conjunction, the upcoming winter solstice, and uh, a few tidbits about some other objects that you can see in the Jackson winter sky. So let's check it out. You've probably already heard about the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that'll be happening coincidentally on the winter solstice of December 21st. You may have also heard it being referred to as the Christmas star. The last part of that may or may not be accurate, but we'll get to that. Here's what astronomers do know for sure. On the evening of December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn are going to appear really close to each other in the southwestern sky. They've been appearing closer and closer to each other all summer and fall as they've made their way across the southern sky along what's called the ecliptic. The imaginary path that the sun, the moon, and the planets follow through the sky. The ecliptic is the projection of Earth's orbit onto the celestial sphere, otherwise known as the sky. The other planets all follow that path because the entire solar system is arranged in a disc-like or pancake-like shape with the sun near its center. Since all the planets orbit around the sun on that same plane, more or less, they all appear to move through the sky in the same direction along that same path. The Earth's tilt on its rotational axis with respect to the sun dictates where the ecliptic is found in the sky at different times of the year and at different times of the day and night. However, if you trace the path the sun takes during the day or the path the moon or the planets take during the night, you'll be looking close to where the ecliptic is. Now, back to Saturn and Jupiter. They'll be within about 0.1 degrees of each other in the sky. That measurement of degrees is the way astronomers talk about the angular distance between objects in the sky. It's 180 degrees from horizon to horizon. The full moon is about one half of a degree across. So Saturn and Jupiter will be about one fifth the diameter of the full moon apart from each other. That's really close. From an observer's point of view, that means that the sunlight reflected off of the much brighter planet, Jupiter, will almost encompass the less bright planet, Saturn. They will almost appear to be one point of light in the sky instead of two. Unless your eyesight isn't good, in which case you might just see one point of light. Planetary conjunctions happen all the time. For Saturn and Jupiter, it's about every 20 years. However, two planets appearing this close to each other in the sky is rare. The last time Jupiter and Saturn appeared this close was the year 1623, but they weren't observable during that conjunction. The last time anyone saw them this close was during the year 1226. The next time they'll appear this close in the sky will be March 15th, 2080. Please keep in mind, that although the planets look close to each other in the sky, they're actually quite far apart from each other. On December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn will be almost 456 million miles apart from each other. Jupiter will be almost 620 million miles from Earth, and Saturn will be about 1.1 billion miles away from Earth. If the skies are clear on Monday, December 21st, Look to the southwest just after sunset and enjoy this amazing conjunction. Earlier, I mentioned that this great conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn has been referred to in the media as the Christmas star. That's a reference to the star of Bethlehem as described in the Christian Gospel of Matthew. It's the story of the three wise men traveling to see the baby Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, it reads, 
When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Depending on how you interpret the Bible, that description could refer to a wide range of things. <clears throat> if you take it literally, then the star of Bethlehem was not an astronomical phenomena because there is nothing that moves in the way described in that verse. However, if you give the author some artistic license, there are a range of astronomical phenomena that the star of Bethlehem could have been. This includes two different planetary conjunctions between Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars that occurred in the years 6 and 5 BC. Interestingly enough, those conjunctions appeared in the constellation Pisces, the fish, which has lots of Christian symbolism. This year's conjunction will appear in the constellation of Capricorn. The star of Bethlehem could have been a planetary conjunction. It might have also been a shooting star, a meteor, which can occur at any time of the year. Meteors are tiny bits of space debris, the size of grains of sand to large marbles left over from asteroids or comets. The bits of debris disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere, giving off a momentary blast of light. Speaking of comets, it's also a possibility that the star of Bethlehem was a comet that appeared in the sky around the year 4 or 5 BC. All these dates are a little tricky because we don't know exactly when Jesus was born, but biblical scholars place it sometime between 7 and 4 BC. We may never know what the star of Bethlehem actually was, but that won't detract from the beauty of the conjunction this year. Coincidentally, this great conjunction is occurring on the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere and in the summer solstice in the Southern Hemisphere. That's right, the seasons are always reversed between the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. Here's why. The Earth orbits around the Sun tilted 23 and a half degrees on its rotational axis. That means that sometimes in orbit around the sun, the northern half of Earth is tilted in towards the sun, while the southern half of Earth is tilted away from the sun, and vice versa. There are also times of the year when neither the northern and southern hemispheres are tilted towards or away from the sun spring equinox and the fall equinox. Those changes in the relative direction of the tilt of the Earth with respect to the Sun are what gives rise to the seasons. Despite a common misconception that the changing distance between the Earth and the Sun results in the seasons. Actually, we're closer to the Sun in the winter compared to the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. When the Northern Hemisphere is tilted in towards the Sun, the Sun's rays hit the Earth at a steeper angle, concentrating more of the Sun's energy from that light into a smaller part of the Earth's surface. That tilt also means that in the summer for the Northern Hemisphere, the Sun appears higher in the sky and thus spends a longer amount of time in the sky each day thereby heating the atmosphere and the Earth up more than it does at other times of the year. The reverse is true for this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere. We are tilted away from the Sun, and so the angle of the Sun's rays are at a much shallower angle, spreading that energy from the Sun over a larger area of the Earth's surface. The Sun appears lower in the sky, and spends fewer daytime hours above our heads. Those two phenomena result in colder temperatures on this part of the Earth this time of year. On December 21st, the tilt of the Earth relative to the Sun will put the Northern Hemisphere facing away from the Sun to its largest extent, and will put the Southern Hemisphere of the Earth facing towards the Sun at its largest extent. So, on that day, we'll have our shortest period of daylight hours in the Northern Hemisphere, and the Southern Hemisphere will have their largest period of daylight hours. You can remember the reasons for the seasons with the following rhyme. 
length of days and angle of rays, but nothing to do with how far away. Now that we've explored the winter solstice and the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, let's take a look at some of the other phenomena taking place in the winter sky in Jackson. My favorite constellation is Orion the Hunter. This time of year, Orion rises in the east at around 9 p.m. It's one of the most recognizable constellations in the sky with three bright stars in alignment making up Orion's belt. Orion's right shoulder on the left side of the constellation as it appears in the sky is marked by what also happens to be my favorite star, Betelgeuse. Don't say that three times. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star that is nearing the end of its existence, sometime between tomorrow and the next 100,000 years, Betelgeuse will explode violently into a supernova. Most of the star will be destroyed except for the core, which will either stabilize as a neutron star or collapse into a black hole. One such stellar explosion took place in the year 1054 AD. It was recorded by the Chinese as well as the Anasazi. The remnant of that supernova is known today as the Crab Nebula. It's just above the constellation Orion in the sky in the constellation Taurus, but you'll need a telescope to see it. Another beautiful object worth staying up for this time of year is the star Sirius. It's the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere and the closest that we can see in the Northern Hemisphere at just 8.6 light years away. Each light year is about 6 trillion miles, so it's still pretty far, but closer than any other star you can see. It'll rise about an hour after Orion does and can be seen to the lower left of where the constellation Orion appears in the sky. You can't miss it. It'll be the brightest thing there, shimmering in all different colors. All the twinkling of stars is actually taking place inside the Earth's atmosphere. The moving molecules in the atmosphere bends the light in different directions, causing a twinkling effect and different colors. By the way, Sirius is called the Dog Star, and in the Harry Potter series, Sirius Black has its namesake. If you remember in the books, Sirius Black morphs into a big black dog. Sirius, the dog star. One other object that's worth checking out will be right above your heads after dark. And that's the Andromeda Galaxy, the closest galaxy to our galaxy, the Milky Way, at just over 2 million light years away, is actually visible to the naked eye when the moon is new. If you look straight above your head, you'll see a small little fuzzy spot, just barely visible. That's the accumulated light of about a trillion stars from over two million light years away. That light has traveled over two million years to reach you, so it left the Andromeda galaxy when our earliest hominid ancestor, Lucy, Australopithecus, was walking on the Earth. Before we finish up, I'd like to say a few more things about Orion and its largest star, Betelgeuse, which, by the way, is over a thousand times larger than the Sun. Only stars at least five times the mass of the Sun will end their existence catastrophically like Betelgeuse. Stars like our Sun will die with the whimper, casting off their outer layers more gently and becoming a planetary nebula. One such nebula, called the Ring Nebula, will be setting in the west around the same time Orion rises. But you'll need a telescope to see that one as well. Just below Orion's belt are a collection of stars that make up Orion's sword. If you have a pair of binoculars, you'll notice that the middle star in that line of stars is quite fuzzy. That's the Great Orion Nebula, a stellar nursery. All stars are formed in similar enormous clouds of gas, many times larger than the solar system, left over from a previous generation of stars that have exploded. Before those stars exploded, they fuse elements in their cores to sustain their own existence, 
producing the energy to work against gravity and light that we see from them. Our sun is massive enough to fuse elements as heavy as silicon, whereas larger stars can fuse up to iron in their cores. When those massive stars explode, enough energy is released in that explosion to fuse all the other heavier elements on the periodic table. Eventually, those huge clouds of debris collide with other such clouds and create the stellar nurseries like the one found in Orion's sword. The heavy elements left over from those stars form the planets around the baby stars that can be seen with the biggest telescopes in the world, like the Hubble Space Telescope. So when you look towards Orion's sword, know that you're looking towards a new generation of stars taking form in the same way that our solar system did five billion years ago. And note that the great American astronomer Carl Sagan got it mostly right when he said that we're made of stardust. We're actually made of recycled stardust. Thanks again for joining me. I'm Samuel Singer with Wyoming Stargazing, wishing you a happy solstice, a happy conjunction, and a bright and joyous holiday season. Take care. Bye.